All right, we are super excited to sit down with Trillium Rose to talk uh, ball striking. She has a fantastic kind of experience as an instructor and also um, an expert in learning and how we practice. So I'm going to enjoy to pick her brain on kind of how we go about these things. So Trillium, we're going to start with, you know, a basic question of like, what does good ball striking mean to you? Like, how do we even, how do you define that if somebody comes to you and says like, I just need to hit it better? I'm glad you started with that because I think a lot of people um, come out with different concepts and you know, the simplest answer is good ball striking would be pr a predictable pattern. And that can mean very different or have very different looks for, ver for people. And as a coach for a really wide variety of skill sets, um, explicitly, I, I, you know, I help people who are never hit shots before and I and I work with people that are playing at the you know highest level I someone just playing USGA event this year so we've got it, we've got very diff different definitions it could be anything from um I I know it could be little toe hooks but you know where that toe hook's gonna go right like I'd rather know I'd rather know what it's gonna be it may not be beautiful um, not everybody's gonna hit the center of the face every time and not everybody's gonna be able to have the you know the, the nine shot shapes um, on command. And I'd say that's a, a pretty high standard to expect oneself to have that unless you're playing at the highest level. So I, I think a majority of people aren't and a majority of people do have shot shapes that are that are somewhat predictable, whether they realize it or not. Um, and that's it's kind of where I think it's nice to have data and feedback to actually figure out what that what that might look like. So back to your question, what is what is good ball striking? Good ball striking is is ball flight that's predictable and controllable. Gotcha, gotcha. So yeah, because you mentioned two things, right? We have ball flight, and then we have where we're hitting it on the club face, right? So in, and you already mentioned it's not necessarily meaning that we hit it in the center of the club face every time, because some people are very good at doing what they do, and maybe it's a little on the heel or a little on the toe, but they're very consistent, and reliable with that potentially. Yeah, I think we have to be we have to be realistic with what with ourselves and how much time we can put into the game, how much you know motivation do we have to really to get to the center of the face. That's it's easy to say you want to hit the center of the face. Sometimes it can be a lot more hours in practice that you really um, don't have. So I think if you know where the ball is hitting the face and you know how that ball is starting off the face and you have a sense of how far it's curving, then you can play golf. Gotcha. So is a lot of your work with players trying to figure out what their ball flight is going to be then and figuring out how to, how to help them stay inside some parameters that help them do that on a, on a regular basis. Is that kind of how you approach that then? My approach is absolutely to figure out, help people figure out what their tendencies are. And what their what their regular occurrences are, and, and it's a, usually a variety of things that kind of go into the swing. Um, obviously, everybody's got a different body type, different athletic aptitude, different experiences, different habits, different issues, different uh, everything. So their like their tendencies. Know thyself. You know, knowing your tendency is going to help you make some better decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, I, I like this question, but like when you think of like a really good ball striker, you know, when you're out at a, a tour event or, or whatever it is, like, who do you think, who comes to mind for you? Like, who's that, like, this is kind of what a, a model of, of good ball striking is. Oh man. At that, at that level, everybody is, or at least everybody has potential. Everybody has the potential to, to, to win that tournament. You know, and I think some people go through um, peaks and everybody goes through peaks and valleys, but others, you know, I think if you're putting your money on certain players, maybe on a week to week basis, some people get hot, some people are working on their stuff and they're kind of in the shop, but, but, you know, you have your tour card, that means you're still up there. So I, I hate to put, I hate to put a name on it because you just, you just never know. Um, I'd say on the, you know, especially on, on the amateur side, I think when you're looking for, so we just had the women's am at Woodmont this year mm -hmm. and you see a lot more unconventional swings and, and you see, you see a lot more highs and lows. Like you can look on the range and watch someone really struggle. You don't see people struggling that much at a tour event on the range. 
Um, but I think at the amateur level, it's it's pretty apparent who's who's going to be um, kind of kicking it into gear and who's not. And I feel like that's kind of really fun to see because as a, as an amateur, um, as an amateur, it's like most people can then relate to that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's dive into some of like our the technical aspects here of how you think about about this. Um, <laughs> So you're trying to find find someone and help someone get more reliable in their their shot shape. What are some of the metrics that you look at, or like what are some of your go tos with launch monitors that you're you're trying to to look at these? Is it path? Is it attack angle? Is it what? Where do you where do you go? I so I use I use a launch monitor in my teaching pretty much every time unless I'm going on a golf course and. In the off season, which for me is right now, this is when we spend a lot of time looking at the club metrics and the ball flight and, and just picking up lots of data about what's actually going on and, and how we're, you know, how we're achieving our goals. So I think this kind of depends on the player. Ultimately, everybody's got their own issues, but on the whole, um, you know, good, good ball strikers have dependable ball flight. And they're not guessing where the ball is going to go. So let's say at the most basic level, you need to know your carry distances. Mm -hmm. That's just, that's like really low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Um, Because you're, I don't, I don't think a lot of people do. You know, I just, I think a lot of people might have sense, a sense of where their ball is going to go and what they need to do. But I don't think a lot of people have really dialed it in. And it's kind of two factors. One is knowing the dis- knowing the distance you are from from your target, mm-hmm. whether that's you're you know trying to carry something or you're trying to land it in the front of, or whatever. Um, so you need to know that, and then you also need to know what your carry distances are with your clubs. It's it's really easy to think, well, uh, I used to be this, or um, I should be that, but what actually are you doing? So, so there's that. Now, in terms of distance, I also like to look at dispersion. So that's the right to left. How often and to what, to what distance is your club, is your ball missing right? Are you missing left? How often are you missing right or left of your target? Um, and, and I don't wanna wander too far down a rabbit hole, but I think when we wanna talk about taking your range game to the course, a lot of people think the range game is better than it is because they're not really looking at what their ball is doing. And they're not really sent, getting a sense of, or a good idea of what the ball is doing the first time you pull it out of the bag. It's okay if, you, if you're warming up and you're working on something to hit 50, you know, to hit 57 irons, that's totally fine. I, I have no problem with blocked practice and that's maybe a totally different discussion. Um, but, but, that, but to really look at the range and your range practice, accurately as a as a measure for how you're going to do in performance on the golf course you can't you can't just hit balls and pick the best ones and say oh i I, i'm good you have to actually do a a lot more than that and i think you have to be a lot more careful about which shots you're hitting and how you're hitting them um, to use that as a diagnostic tool um uh, so anyway how how do you help how do you help dispersion patterns inform the way that you practice or the way that you teach like if i come to you and say like my, you know, my dispersion pattern is just, it's not working. It's that we're here and we're here and I don't know what's going on. Like what, what are some of the things that, that you look at when you see that symptom? Yeah. Right off the bat, I think the easiest thing is to pick your target and then watch the ball as it leaves the face and watch what happens at when it lands. So if it leaves the face to the right of your target, let's just use a right-hander, that, that, that ball flight is starting right at the target. So your face is probably appropriately open if it then curves back because you're trying to draw it curves back to the target if you cross that target line i consider that a hook if you leave it to the right of that target but it's still within you know 15 feet that would be a perfect little draw because it started right curved back in but didn't cross that line you know so this is just a, a tighter way of looking at how well you hit that shot um, so anyway, so having a target line and then having, having some parameters, uh, having some you know, distance measurements, markers near the target to say, well, well, am I 15 feet? Am I 25 feet? Am I 50 feet away from, from that target? 
um, your driving range often isn't going to show you that. You just if you're just hitting out into the abyss, it just it feels a lot better than it probably was. And are you a proponent of picking that one shot shape? Like if I'm going to hit that little draw like that and not let it cross the line, like are you a proponent of choosing one and you just like you stick with that and you try to hone that one shot? For most people, I am a proponent of having one shot shape, at least one bread and butter, predominant, reliable. I can do this on the last hole when I need it to win the tournament type of shot. I'm not, I'm not saying I don't think it's good to be able to shape your shots. I, I think it, it's dangerous for people to go down a path where they're trying to do too many things, where they're trying to have too many shot shapes, and then they kind of lose feel for one that they really know well. Um, I mean, I think simplicity is key, right? Like too many people get in trouble because they, they try to do something that really isn't necessary in the first place. And then, you know, they end up in a, in a bad spot where if you just <laughs> stuck with, you know, it, it, it all comes back to knowing your dispersion pattern, in my opinion, right? If you yeah. know that you don't know, really know where that ball is <laughs> going to go, then you uh, start playing golf a little bit differently than if you think you're trying to shape one in, you know, right to left to that, that pin on the, you know, back left-hand side or, or whatnot. I don't know. That's, that's just my, my opinion on, on folks going out. I totally agree. I totally agree with that. You know, I, golf's a hard game. It's, it's hard enough. You know, I, I admire people that, that want and aspire to work on things to, to push themselves. And I, and I'm, I'm a big advocate of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone um, just without sacrificing your ability to do something reliable and on, and on command. And I'd say that's a lot easier said than done. Um, I guess other metrics, I mean, I, I, I really think if there are different things that people could work on if they're trying to trying to achieve goals, let's say you're trying to get some distance, well, then club head speed is important to look at. So that's one metric that I might highlight for somebody that's, you know, that's, that's low on the speed. Um, you know, and then we can always, we can always unpack that and say, well, why is your speed slow and what's causing that on a technical side? But if you don't even know what it is, then, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to work on it? Lots I've got an interesting one here. I, so I love looking at that because I think too many people try to hit it farther without really knowing if they're actually hitting it farther, right? They just, they don't have the right metrics or the data to even prove it. Um, but on, on top of that, if I'm trying to go hit it farther and I'm trying to train that skill, do you like, would you like to look at club head speed or would you like to look at ball speed? What's your, if you're trying to train distance and hit it farther and that's it. I like club head speed for driver and ball speed for irons. And I think the, the reason is club head speed, because there's a lot of times I, mean, I like using the super speed sticks and the super speed golf and you don't, you don't get ball speed because oftentimes you're not swinging with the ball. So if, as long as you're looking at club head speed with the sticks, may as well just stay consistent and look at club head speed with, um, you know, with the driver, you know, ball speed gives us a little bit more because it tells us whether we're hitting the center of the face or not, you know, it tells us, are we getting that, that trampoline effect? Are we getting that ball to really bounce hard? Um, and so I feel, I feel like it's kind of, it's double packed. You get, you get two in one ball speed. Gotcha. Do you feel like when people train speed, they get too caught up on trying to hit it solid as well though? Is that kind of why you like club head speed for the driver or? Um, yeah, I mean, everybody has a, you know, we're always at risk of getting caught up in something with, with golf. It's easy, to, <laughs> but I, I, I mean, I think with driver, I mostly, club head speed is also a metric that people are used to looking at. And, you know, people talk about club head speed on television. You know, we all know that Tiger is at 125 post back surgery, you know, so that number, that number means something, you know, 90, 90 miles an hour and up on the LPJ tour. That means something. I think if you get into ball speed with the driver, a lot of people don't recognize what those numbers mean. Um, and, and that doesn't mean you can't learn them. It just, it's just a lot faster for people to understand what it is. <clears throat> and gotcha. Gotcha. Sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> um, but there are some other metrics. If let's say you're not working on speed, other metrics, other metrics that I think are interesting to look at would be launch angle, launch angle, especially with your wedges, the distance wedges, meaning your shots that you're looking to hit and stick on the green. And um, 
I like to see that launch angle under 30. You know, we're looking at a, a pitching wedge, a gap wedge, a, you know, even a sand wedge, high spin, um, low trajectory, you know, one hop and stop kind of thing. So not, not the little finesse lob shots where you're, you know, you're trying to kind of get that ball up and, and do something unusual, but your distance wedges. So I find that launch angle can be important. It could also be important with your driver too. Like, let's see if, what your launch is. And are you optimizing that? Well, I, I find launch angle to be really freaking hard to control. Like, <laughs> like I, with from wedges to irons as well. Like if you try to go play games of controlling your launch angle, um, I just, it's tough in, in my opinion to, to do some of that stuff. It's, it's not as easy as you might, as you might think. That's probably a good thing to do. I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, I think start small. Like everything starts small. Start with a you know an 80 yard 80 yard shot with your gap wedge, uh, because ultimately launch angle is affected so much by the the shaft lean, and the shaft lean is a function of you know your wrist and you know and your lead arm and how well your lead arm can connect to your trunk so i mean that's a very um it, it's a very hard movement because it happens through impact hard to think about it while you're doing it and if you and you have a tendency to pe be pretty loose with your wrist then it's it's a bit more manufactured so i, I mean i i sympathize i i know how that is and and with a driver, it could be something as, as far as your setup. You could set up a little differently with a little more side bend with your upper torso. You could kind of put a little more pressure on your lead foot. You could, you know, there's a little soften that trail arm. I mean, there's things you can do, I think, that are a little easier with your driver um, if you know what to do. But I do, I, I agree with you. I think with a, like a regular stock mid iron shot, that's hard to do. Yeah, because that is a function of a, a solid strike. And like you said, shaft lean you know, as well, there, there are a lot of components that you have to be able to control to adjust your launch angle on, on command or kind of hit tolerances. If you're trying to train inside, you know, particular windows or whatnot. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so we talked about dispersion. We talked about distance, we uh, carry distance, speed, launch angle. Um, you know, one thing that I also do is I, I, um, one thing I also do is I save data. I put it into a file so I can see what people are doing over time. We could just benchmarking basically, Get, keeping track of someone's patterns over the long haul to see whether we've improved, we've stayed the same, has anything changed? Um, so, you know, I think that's also valuable too, just to keep track of what you're doing. What do you think when it comes to like looking at data like that, um, let's say I'm, I'm looking back at my past few, few sessions I've been, you know, working on just normal stock iron shots. Like how do I know if what I'm doing is good or not, I guess. Right. So, you know, I, let's say I'm a, I'm a scratch golfer and I'm, I'm hitting an eight iron. I'm looking at like some shots on a dispersion pattern, right. On my launch monitor. How do I decide like, I need, you know, this is not good enough. I should tighten this up. I should try to figure out how to do this. Or like, no, like you're doing great. Do you have any ways that you help students like figure out like, Hey, you're actually doing a great job. Like just keep, keep working on what you're doing. Cause you're doing fantastic. Do you have any recommendations around understanding where you're actually at? Yeah, sure. And, and I think that's just right in line with what we're talking about, which is benchmarking and recording what your practice session might look like. So if you were to take seven or 10 or 15 or, you know, a number of shots with the same club and have one focus, your focus is to hit it as close to the target as possible. Huh? That's kind of like golf and, and just measure and just see, huh, where are we? And the first time you do it, that's setting a baseline. It's like, if you're trying to lose weight, all right, well, we got to start somewhere. How much do you weigh now? Let's just see, well, where are your balls falling? And the cool thing is with, with, with launch monitors, like Rapsodo does this and TrackMarin does this and I know FlightScope does it too, is there'll be a circle around all of your balls. Well, how tight is that little circle? Okay, let's, so let's say you move up the bag from a pitch to a nine, eight, seven, six, seven, and let's say it gets your five and then the five, five is shorter than the six. The, let's say your, your five iron shots overlap the six. Well, that gives us some good information. Something's not right. You're probably not hitting the center of the face because you're losing a significant amount of distance. Something's going on. The club's too long. You're dumping it. You're hitting the 
you're hitting the club before the ball, the club's slowing down. You are, you know, trying to hit it too far and your arms are starting to tighten up and you lose club head speed. I mean, there could be any, any reason, but that gives us some information and some, some good ideas of how we need to kind of spend our time going forward. You know, so I, I think the data basically can tell us what does that dispersion look like? What's, you, you can see if, if you've hit no greens with your three wood, you know, spend some time on that three wood. You know, you start, you, people tend to start long, um, on the short side of things when they're warming up, they start with the shorter, by the time, you know, they have to get to the T or they've got to go back and do something else in their life, they never made it to their three wood. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the three wood gets sure. left out. Yep. No, that, that's super interesting. So you suggest some kind of ritual or routine where you you do kind of a benchmarking exercise like that a little bit on a on a regular basis. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I, I call it just testing, just test, test, test. You know, in school you had pop quizzes. Let's see where you are. Let's let's test it. Let's see. You know, under pressure, under duress, every ball counts. You don't have that many shots. Give yourself five shots to do it. Give yourself three. Give yourself one shot to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't really know many, I don't know anyone that probably does that on a regular basis. I'll be honest. Um, and just, so it's that general testing is you can see where you're at over time. And it also just applies pressure where you have to perform under that pressure on a regular basis. And you have it, um, kind of in a database, you can review where you're at. Um, no, that's, that's fantastic. That's probably a ritual that a lot of folks need to need to get in, need to get into. I, I haven't done it. I know that. And I definitely could be, um, so that's, that's very interesting. Very good. Very good. What, what, do you look for any trends in that or, or what, is there anything to look for when you, when you take people through that? Geez, there's usually, usually something shows up, yeah. but I'd say most of the time, I mean, most of the time from my experience teaching just hundreds, hundreds of people, people are usually better with their short irons than they are the long irons. I mean, long irons are usually more unwieldy, harder to hit the center of the face occasionally I'll get someone who's really, really strong with their, oh, my favorite irons, my four iron. I don't, I don't see that a lot, but sometimes you do. Um, sometimes you do. And you, sometimes you see people who are great with their fairway woods, but oftentimes I, I don't, that's usually not people's strong suit. Yep. So we have a new ritual that we can start doing. Do you have any other games or any other practice routines kind of around this, that same kind of thing? Do you like doing things like, um, you know, try to have your launch angle go here, here, here and play games like that. Or like, what, what are some of the things that you like doing with, with students? Oh, so I love, I love practicing with other people. If you can get a buddy and, and have a little competition, have a game that makes it so much more fun and it, you know, it holds you accountable. All right. Closest to the pin, or let's see who can get the highest. Okay. You get to choose the target or three points for this, add points, points, points are so great. And these points are fun and put pressure on it and make it makes the, you know, the process a little more enjoyable. Um, lot, I mean, you could just make up, so you could just make things up on the fly. Kids are really good at doing this, by the way. So, you know, if you have a kid who's, you know, 10, 11, 12, bring them along and, uh, you know, and they'll come up with some fun games. Um, I think that's an, uh, also something to be said for going, you know, going out on the golf course and, and kind of paying attention to what's happening when you're out there, that can also be a really good way to then come back and say, okay, this is what I know I need to, I need to do. And that gives you more motivation, you know, when you're on the driving range, giving yourself a chance to do it. Um, I, I like strike spray too. That's the spray that you, you know, you can see where you're making contact on the face. Um, that, that's a great, you know, great way to do it. I think overall, keep your, keep your goals simple, you know, so keep your intention singular, um, you know, and from a motor learning standpoint, if you've got one idea, you've got one plan that, you know, you're trying to do, uh, it's a lot easier to kind of give yourself feedback, whether you adhere to that plan or not. You know, if you're, you're planning, you execute, then you got to evaluate whether you've done it. And if your plan was, was murky to begin with, it's really hard to know whether you've done it. I think all too often people fall into this, this kind of um, comfortable zone and I'm guilty of it uh, where you're just hitting and you're like, all right, let's just see what happens. I mean, it's really fun to just do that, to just hit and, you know, I'm just going to not think I'm going to let it, I'm just going to feel and let it go. 
And it's a great place to be when you're playing well. It's a great place. And, and I do that when I'm on the golf course, I just pull it out. I feel it. I, I really don't have a ton of swing thoughts when I'm on a golf course. I might have one or two. Um, but I think what we're talking about is we're talking about trying to make changes or improvements. If we're trying to like technically do something, then you, then you need to have a plan. If you're just, if you're just warming up and, and, you, and things are working well and you just want to get a feel for it. Okay. All right, go ahead and just hit one and hit or two, one or two and, and and see what happens. But don't don't mistake one for the other. I'd say just be be clear about if you're trying to change something, then you have to do some kind of work to put yourself into a position where you're making a change. You're doing something different than you've done, or you're trying to have some awareness of what you're changing. Like that's a totally different environment than in the middle of the season. You have a tournament tomorrow. You, you, you gotta just kind of you're feeling good you're you're not thinking too much you're just hitting shots did that make sense yep yep what's an example of having a plan or what, is, what does a good plan mean to you oh uh, uh, just being intentional i mean first of all having a plan means you know having a clear intention of what you're doing and why you're doing it and that could be hmm, i'm going out to play with my with my friends the round doesn't matter that much um we're out here to have fun. My plan is to warm my body up so I don't pull a muscle. My plan is to, to hit some shots and, and get a good feeling for, let's say, my tempo. Or my hips tend to be tight. I want to. My plan's going to be to feel like I get I, I get some rotation in my pelvis. Uh, it, it, that's it's bland, but it's at least it's it's singular. My plan could be, you know what? My driver has been a mess. My plan. I need to I need to spend some time on the range. And I need to work out what was going on. Okay, so first I'm just going to, first I'm gonna work on hitting the center of the face. And then for five minutes, I'm just, that's all I'm gonna think about. My next plan is gonna be, okay, I'm gonna check my balance. And I know sometimes my balance gets off, I get too much on the toes. Okay, I'm gonna check, that's my plan. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And everybody's got a different pull in what they need to do, but at least, at least I've, got, I've got one thing going on so that I know I can really get that one thing working. I, I think that golfers and probably humans are really good at being reactive instead of intentional. And, and golf, I think, really illustrates that of how reactive we get, um, especially during our practice when one thing happens um, that doesn't necessarily mean we need to react in a, in, you know, in a massive kind of way, which, which we often do. So I love some of those intentions that you brought to the table there that we can that we can take because I don't know enough you know many people that do that and and we all need to do that Cordy you just put a bow on it that was perfect you know <laughs> being intentional as opposed to reactive yeah. nicely nicely that was exactly right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we've got some good kind of routines here. I like this a lot. Um, there are a lot of good things. Um, and these are, you know, we, we've, we obviously have our $20,000 launch monitors and we have our $500 launch monitors. And a lot of these, what we've talked about today are things we can do with both, um, which is, which is fantastic. I mean, that's, that's the goal is that we all can go out and do these things on a regular basis um, work on these skills, not just once a month or once a week, but as often as we're out practicing and training, I think is, is key to this. Totally. I, I totally agree with that. And I think in this day and age, you know, maybe not in 2020, cause everybody kind of slowed down, but, uh, once everything ramps back up time, time's hard to find. And what, how do you spend your time? I love, I love being efficient. I love getting the most out of of practice. And I love, you know, I love, I love moving ahead and getting better and, you know, and seeing results. So I, I'm, I'm huge on efficiency and doing it smarter, you know, not necessarily adding more time than I need, but, but making the most of my time. Just one last thought before we go, I can't resist a little practice um, insight here. So you mentioned playing games with people and doing like competitions and points is, is a really valuable tool. And I know a lot of folks would say, before I do that, I need to go and hit this large bucket of balls to do to fix X, Y, Z. Can you talk to the person that puts that the that aspect of training kind of on the back burner after they fix X, Y, Z, um, or they work on X, Y, Z? Could you could you talk to that person a little bit? 
Yeah. The <laughs> I couldn't this resist. Is, I just love opening up this this can this of is, here and kind this of is, this is, I mean, I spent two years really, really in the weeds on this one. Um, and I know you know really well the research in learning, it almost all points to skill based movements and finding um, finding different targets often and practicing the way you'd, you know you'd play and the way you'd play would be you have one shot one target and you have to construct a plan for that the research doesn't support sitting there and hitting a bucket of balls to the same target um, in the same movement pattern over and over now as a coach, I have something to say on that because I think most people, most people need to work on their technique. Golf is a highly complex movement. It's an extremely difficult movement to do well, extremely. And it involves a lot of components and maximizing it is even harder. So most people do need to spend time with a bucket of balls working out a swing. <clears throat> question is, is that getting you ready to play? The answer is kind of. If you're looking to go out and play, you need to work on the playing. And that may mean your technique is not exactly as comfortable or as done as you want it to be. Let me give an example. I've got a student who's early in learning. We spend four hours on the golf course every week. We do two hour playing lessons twice a week. Now you look at her swing and you'd say, you probably need to spend a hundred hours on the driving range. And I, I kind of agree. I mean, her swing doesn't look great sometimes, but she makes it work so well because she's done it and she hits every ball as it lies. Rule 13-1A, you know, hit the ball as it lies. She's out there. She doesn't move the ball and she hits it. Okay. This lady could hit the ball off a downhill line out of the rough onto the green. And you're like, how did you do that? Why? Because she's done it a lot, but not over and over and over. She did it because she had to solve it. And that act of solving it is really hard. It's really hard. So she has worked on adapting to the environment, solving it when it counts and having one chance to do it really hard. Now I can bring her to a driving range and she can move, you know, we've been on the driving range three or four times and we know, we know what she needs to do. She knows what she needs to do, but the fact that she's spending less time doing it means that there's more emphasis on each shot. Interesting case study. And this is where all the, not all, but a, a ton of motor learning research has basically come out with the same results. Like, so make it hard, make it count have a different you know and and that's where when you said having the games and the points that's basically what she's doing because you don't get a chance to hit a ton of them so I, so anyway i think that 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 scenario is often overlooked and very very highly misunderstood um i think it's also misunderstood when people are people like direct direct their students or their friends to only playing and only well okay but if you have a horrible issue that you need to work on, yes, go do some block practice, go do it. You need to do it. And a lot of people do need to do it because you need to have a feel and a memory and a concept and you need to figure out what that is. So there's a good balance. Anyway, I'm glad you brought that up. It's something I care a lot about and I, and I really blend a lot of this into, into my coaching style and my perspective. And I found that um, people, people do get better faster when they add some points and they, they go out there and do it. So is it blending technique and skills training together instead of keeping them separate? Is that, is that some of what you do then? Yeah. I mean, we have to, I think it's, yeah. I can't tell someone just to do block practice and, and that's it. It gets boring. Um, at the same time, I can't tell someone just to do skills, but then they may not improve as much. So it has to be some kind of blend. And I think ultimately what we've been talking about is, is just being aware of what you're doing and when you're doing it and why you're doing it. Awesome. Hey, thanks for hanging out today. I appreciate this. Thanks for diving in there just uh, for a, one question at the end on some on some practice stuff. But um, you've been doing a bunch of stuff on Instagram. Folks can go watch stuff there. Where else can folks find you find you at? 
No, oh, thanks. Yeah, Instagram's fun. I, it, you know, I, Instagram, it is what it is. It's been quick and fast and, you know, it's not a, it's not, you know, a comprehensive solution to, to playing golf, but I think it's, you know, they're just my offerings for things here and there. If you want to pick something up, um, if you are learning golf for the first time, I've got a program called the first step. It's uh, it's at home. It's self-paced. It's 20 videos. All of them are under 10 minutes. Uh, it's $99. And, um, and it's, which I think is a great bargain compared to, you know, taking lessons. And I was inspired by all of the people that I've taught to, you know, to play from the very first time. And I thought, you know, why don't I just make a, a course that can get people started, that can build really strong, you know, the 30 to 50 yard shot. If you can do that shot, you are, you know, you're off to the races. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so they can check that out. That's, yeah. there's a link to that on my Instagram as well. Awesome. And then you are based out of, or where can people, if they want to come get a lesson from you, hang out in person? Yeah, I'm at Woodmont Country Club. I'm right outside of uh, Washington, D.C., um, in um, in Rockville, Maryland. Fantastic. Thanks for hanging out. We appreciate it. Thanks, Cordy. You're the best. I appreciate it.